And you know, when I was preparing for this, I was reading up about the past of artificial intelligence and the history of it, of course. And uh, I kept running across a statement from Picasso, actually, and Kevin Kelly, who said that machines are for answers, humans are for questions. So I think that's a very good summary. <laughs> right? If we're going to have better people working and improve our staff and our team and our future, we need to ask more questions. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, famous futurist, once said that we go to school and what happens there is that we have the genius taken out. Right? We're being degeniused in school. And that's so true. Uh, when I went to school, that is kind of what happened. I went to music school and I went to also to university and, and in many ways we, we get taught to function. Well, the future isn't about functioning. Uh, in fact, it has never been really about functioning, but machines are functioning. That's what machines do. A car, an AI, a robot, right? They're not alive, they're not conscious, they're functioning. They're efficient. Efficiency is for robots. We should print that out and put that over the top of the, of the door when we come into the workplace, right? Efficiency is for robots. It's not for us. We all like efficiency for certain reasons, but you didn't marry your husband or your wife because of efficiency, right? You married because you know, there's many more reasons why, you know, so efficiency is just one of the things. And at work, we always focus so much on efficiency, and I think that's a big mistake for the future, because efficiency means we're going to compete with machines. Machines are infinitely more efficient. We can't compete. Right now, they're still pretty inefficient, you know. But kind of that's the future. So uh, I'll start with the first statement here. I think really what we're talking about today is not AI, artificial intelligence, it's IA, right? intelligent assistance. These machines are not intelligent, they're not thinking, they're not cognitive, they're, not, they're smart to some degree. They're better software, essentially. ChatGPT is a great example. It was a great uh, quote I read on Twitter the other day. It says, ChatGPT, the, the tool I'll show you in a minute, it's kind of like economists. Always have an opinion, seldom right. Just kidding, if you're an economist, then excuse me. At least I'm not making lawyer jokes. But, and then we have a little bit of this. In many ways, you can say artificial intelligence is kind of like, uh, if we take Google Maps, right? It's intelligent, but many of us are, you know, if you use Google Maps in Riga, you will say, no, 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 that, that can't be true. It's just not. Right. The other day in Switzerland, I used Google Map to go somewhere, and it led me up a mountain road. That was the quickest way. And when I got to the end of the road, there was a barrier and a footpath. Right? And Google Maps said I should drive there. It's the quickest way. Obviously not true. Um, Six months ago, I was in Rio de Janeiro, and they told me the story of a, of a Swiss couple that arrived in Rio de Janeiro. They were renting a car. They were going to go to the hotel. And the Google Maps app sent them through the favela, you know, the slums, at 7 p.m. Because it's the quickest way. Right? Well, they almost got killed because of Google Maps. Right? So AI is kind of interesting, but is it real? Right? Does a machine measure reality? Well, the answer is really quite obvious. You know, a, a great machine can measure great data. Like the best possible camera in the world can measure 3% of the human eye. 3%. That's also because we don't see with the eye. You know, when, when I see you, I smell, I, I hear, I taste, you know, I, I, that's what humans do. 100% of reality. Machines don't see reality. They see numbers, binary. Right? So very important to remember when we go into this future what happens here. As we move into this future, it's warp drive change. Remember Star Trek, right? It's like the warp drive button. We've just hit the warp drive button with artificial intelligence. And basically the next 10 years will bring more change than the previous 100 years. I keep saying this and people keep saying, oh no, that can't be true because Last 100 years, we had the nuclear bomb, the internet, yeah. But now, in the next 10 years, quantum computing, supercomputing, 
artificial intelligence, of course, robotics, language understanding, language recognition, 3D printing, genome editing. You know, this, yeah, you better be prepared. What's going to happen to jobs? Clearly, there'll be lots and lots of new jobs, but we have no idea what they're going to be. 12 years ago, there was almost no social media job. Today, 21 million people work on social media. But most of them didn't go to social media school. <laughs> they, they, they just learned it on the job. And it's going to be like this a lot. We'll, we'll see a future where much of our jobs will be created, and there's no formal education. It's just a way of you know, learning how to learn. Basically, science fiction is becoming science fact. And it's, you know, this is both exciting and scary. You know, if you like science fiction, then you can say, wow, Blade Runner or Ex Machina, you know, great. But science fiction becoming science fact also creates issues. For example, you may remember Black Mirror, right? Anybody watch Black Mirror on Netflix? Right? When you watch Black Mirror, sometimes you're thinking like, man, this is actually happening today. It's social media. And, and sometimes we don't want that to happen, so it's a really important conversation to have. We're going to the future of three revolutions. First, the digital revolution, which is an old hat, but everywhere. The sustainability revolution, that's 100 times as big as the digital revolution. And then the purpose revolution. Purpose means, especially millennials, people are asking now for a larger story than money. My age. You know, we were perfectly fine with having a good life and money, right? That is the baby boomer's credo. Success, money, work. Like, work fills our lives. But are you speaking to people 25 to 40 years old? They're going to ask for different things. People, planet, purpose, prosperity. It's a mix. To be sure, millennials, my kids are millennials, they also like money. It's not that I don't like money, but they have a bigger question. The question is, are we going to do something that really fulfills us rather than just profit and growth? And all of these revolutions are going to impact greatly on work and education. So, for example, the digital revolution means that we're going to work differently, and maybe we don't need to learn like we used to. The sustainable revolution says, everything that we used to do with fossil fuel, oil and gas, nuclear, maybe even coal, is changing to be circular. It's a different way of life. When we talk about just right here, it's a 150 trillion euro shift that we're going through. And as a result, capitalism will change, will become more inclusive. And that's a 10-year you know, process. That's actually pretty fast. So, so when we go into that future in terms of technology, we're seeing four different types of technology upstaging our work. The first one is information technology. That's everywhere, cloud computing and all that. Of course, energy and climate and food technology, creating new ecosystems, the circular economy, biotechnology, creating new products that used to be in nature. And the biggest boost right now, artificial intelligence technology. Consider yourself lucky, because all of that has been around for a long time, 20 years at least. Now all four are happening at the same time. This means new jobs, new possibilities, new trainings, global activity, maybe a kind of a global consciousness, if we're lucky. Just here, the World Economic Forum says roughly 100 million new jobs in the next 20 years. Many of them used to be jobs that are not paid for, that climate activists, monitoring, you know, all of the things that used to happen anyway. So, Basically, it's a huge shift here in terms of what we have to learn and how we do learn it, and a lot of people are worried or excited, one of the two. <laughs> and we have to ask a question. I think technology, in many ways, is a, a present, but can also be a bomb. Well, that's true for all technology. <laughs> it's not just AI. I mean, you can take a hammer, build a house, or you can take the hammer and kill your neighbor. You wouldn't say that we should not have hammers, right? clearly. It's the same with artificial intelligence, except it's a much bigger hammer. And it's not that hard to make. So what's the answer? 
We ban ChatGPT, we ban AI, we ban research. No, that's not the answer, right? Because like, we do want the present. The answer is we have to take a look at the present, make it as good as possible, and deal with the circumstances, the externalities. We, need, we didn't do that with climate change. The result is we're going to have to really eat you know, 20 years of problems to fix that. So that is something we can't do with artificial intelligence because it's just going to be too hard to actually fix. So what's happening here is that we have to take a wider view. And the funny part, of course, is it's not just artificial intelligence that's coming. It's six different, I call them the kingmakers, right? Six different things. Of course, first AI, and then, of course, quantum computing, right? Supercomputing, which basically means that we will have unlimited computing power probably in five years. So right now, the human genome to run analysis on this would take a week, cost 800 euros. In five years, it's 12 seconds. You can do it while you're dating, and it's like one euro. Right? Nuclear fusion, the reverse of fission. Once we have that, we have unlimited, abundant energy. It's like I always say, it's energy like Spotify. <laughs> so we're still paying, but we don't, we don't even notice. That's 15 years away, maybe. Right, then we have, of course, uh, synthetic biology, inventing products from nature. That's fermentation, cultured meat, and so on. Human genome editing, it's a big ethical topic. And lastly, geoengineering, fixing the Earth. So you can imagine with all of those things, tremendous opportunities, tremendous new business, but if we don't agree on what we want, it's game over. And we, if we don't agree on how we're going to govern all these things, then we're talking about an arms race. And this is already happening with AI. Right? So the important thing is not that we say, no, 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 we don't want any of this. There's no such thing. That option does not exist. Right? Also because it's going to create all of the new jobs here. And many of them will really bring new riches to us. So we have to think about what we want with this. So if I zoom in on the past a little bit, Albert Hubbard, 1911. One machine can do the work of 50 ordinary men. Oh, everybody was talking about men back then, you know, not women, but we'll just add women here. No machine can do the work of one extraordinary man. That was 1911. That's today, right? One machine can do the work of 50 ordinary women but not of an extraordinary woman. And this is what we need to do in, in adult learning and training, and of course, kids as well. We have to be extraordinary. Well, that's a tall order, you know, if you've always been taught that you have to be ordinary so you can have a job. <laughs> that's like the reverse. Next, Marshall McLuhan from the 70s. Education must shift from instruction da, 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 to discovery. Discovery. Remember that word, discovery? <laughs> You have to discover your own job. You have to discover the future. You have to discover yourself. This is what we do at work, ideally. And this is how we're going to find new things. Finally, the last quote is Agasimov from the 80s. That's the trouble with education. We think it's for the young, but it's not something that we can finish. So, I mean, let's think about this for a second. We're all getting older. In France, we already have, you know, an attempt to lift the retirement age. We're going to keep working. We're going to keep working because we like it. Not like we do today, maybe. But we're going to keep contributing. I mean, what is the solution to the entire world getting older is not to get rid of people when they're 60 years old, but to keep contributing in, in some way. So the shortage of work will be done mostly by people who are just going to do the work without a degree, for example, and instantly learn, and by older people continuing to work. Maybe not as a full-time thing. Right? So these sh uh, shifts are all around us. Let's briefly define what AI actually is. Artificial intelligence, computer system that turn data and information into knowledge. This is by Demis Hassabis, the CEO of DeepMind. If you're in education, this should put the fear into you. 
I mean, you know, if computers can turn data information into knowledge, what do we have? Well, the answer is computer knowledge is completely different. Right now, computer knowledge, for example, in ChatGPT or artificial intelligence, has access to the entire internet, can dredge up all the good, all the bad, it has no judgment, no values, no fixing, no human orientation, no consciousness, no nothing. It's just zeros and ones. So it will tell you, for example, if you're looking to hire a data scientist, right, that no woman is qualified to be a data scientist. That is because 99% of data scientists are men. That is the ludicrous logic of a machine, like Google Maps. We want the opposite, but machines don't see it that way. Uh, generative AI, generative that can create content, computer systems that turn information and data and knowledge into content. This is what's happening right now. So I can use the computer to write stuff. I can use it to make pictures. I can use it to make images. I used to pay people to remove the backgrounds from my videos so I can use them with funny animations and stuff on YouTube. Right? It's called background removal, pretty expensive. Now this app called uh, Runway can do it basically for free. Well, I don't know, five cents. Remove the background. You may have heard about the writer's strike in Hollywood. Right? The screenwriters are on strike. Because Hollywood is saying, we're going to feed all of these screen plays that have ever been written for successful TV shows. We're going to feed that into an artificial intelligence. And then we tell the AI to make a new screenplay. So it will write something that's going to be just as, as important and sell. And then we'll give this to one writer who's going to fix the AI. And you can imagine that it, that doesn't come across very well with somebody who writes screenplays. You know? <laughs> so yeah, that's what we have here. Give me some examples. This is the Google CEO talking about the new Gmail application where you can answer questions and write emails. For example, here you want to write to an airline to get a refund, and you have a simple mail, and this is what you can do now with Google. So this, the system does that for you. Does it right now? You can try it on Gmail. Right? So, I mean, this is primitive. I mean, primitive in parentheses is actually very difficult. But, but this is not rocket science. Right? Is that good or bad? I tend to think it can be good sometimes, but imagine if you write marketing messages, and now we can write more marketing messages. You know, that's, that's amazing, but I don't know what the sense of that would be. But uh, here we have an app that builds a, uh, an application. In, for the mobile phone, and you just type what you want and it makes it instantly. It's like a program in a box. Of course, it'll be ugly and, you know, yes. But you can see where this is going. And here is my favorite one. And this one manages to make me look good. So I like it a lot. It's called Lenza. I pay for that. I wish it could fix me physically as well. And then I have other apps that I use to make interesting videos. I think it could be great for certain situations. That's my favorite right there. Anyway, mm -hmm. so it does all those things that used to be very fancy, right? So because I'm lazy, I asked ChatGPT Pro that I'm subscribing to and giving money to those guys for some reason. I asked about the skills we need for business and management in the future. So you just go to OpenAI ChatGPT, log in, and it gives you answers. So see what it says. This is live. As the adoption of AI decrease, increases, we need uh, human skills, few crucial skills of the future, strategic decision making, AI literacy, emotional intelligence, it tells me I, we need. <laughs> That's pretty interesting for a machine. Communication, collaboration, innovation, and creativity, it gives me ideas. It's not the gospel, it's not, I couldn't have thought of that myself, of course. But it's an interesting reminder, right? Remember again, machines are for answers, humans are for questions. It's not that you don't come up with this. But it's interesting. So if you work for a company or the government, you can put in a query and you can get some interesting results. You know, we'll act on some new kind of thinking. But do not take it as the gospel. This is like Google Maps. It could be utterly wrong, utterly mistaken, utterly foolish. 
If I ask it about myself, and I push it really hard, it will invent stuff that I haven't done. Like I ask it, you know, is Gerrit an, an expert on AI? And it says blah, 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 my website. And then I says, no, you have to prove to me that, AI, that Gerrit is actually good with AI. And it says, oh no, he's published this really scientific article. It makes a fake link to an article that doesn't exist, just because I push for it. Well, that's pretty amazing, right? But imagine you're making actual decisions in reality based on something that is essentially a parrot. Yeah, it's nice to have a parrot, you know, it's not, not bad. But, but so it's, it's a really good tool. I use it a lot, but I use it for practical things, not for the gospel. Yeah. So here's the bottom line of this. As machines take over for the routine work, I'll explain in a second, our human-only attributes become invaluable. That's why we're here. Connecting, understanding. Here's a couple of job titles of the future. My favorite one is this, the nature deficit therapist. You know, a person that provides therapy for people who have lost touch with reality. <laughs> well, there, there seem to be a few of those around. But a couple new jobs like this. And I think it's really interesting to see you know, when Alvin Toffler says the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. I mean, everybody uses that quote, but still it's very pertinent. In your company or your organization, if you can't learn and unlearn, you're, you're a toast. And it doesn't matter how old you are. And of course, the interesting part is we can still all do that. Our, our brains are plastic. They're not frozen. So even if you're 60 years old, you can unlearn and relearn. Not a question of age. I've seen some frozen people when they are 25, and who just can't seem to question anything. So this is really important that we move in this direction. So I was in Delhi a few months ago, and uh, I ran across this guy, Sadhguru. I'm not usually into gurus, but I ran across this guy. So I, I took a look at this pretty famous website on YouTube, and this is what he said about the future of work. You must be able to do something beyond your intellect. Human being has many layers to be intelligence. Intellect is only a small something that the damn machine can't do. I mean that that is the bottom line. If you work like a robot, a robot takes your job. Simple as that. I mean, people work a little bit like robots. All of us work a, li a little bit like robots. That's called routine work. Filing, checking, maintaining. You know. But machines are learning their routine. In India, uh, the country graduates one million engineers per year. Many of them move on for a $300 a month job building bridges. You don't think a machine can build a bridge? Or fix the mobile network? It can do all of those things. It's learning all of those things. Right. Routine work is not for us, except for the routine that makes other work meaningful. There are exemptions. So unloading a truck, now this is DHL. I mean, this machine probably costs, I don't know, two million euros. It's hardly worth it not having people unload the truck, in my view. But hey, you know, in, in principle, it's working. And we can print houses. So if you're in construction, you're going to print a house, and you're going to print the house that is with, with recyclable concrete. So construction business will com go completely upside down. And yes, there are ugly houses, of course. But you know, you can print the furniture too, in the house, using a printer. And then later you can print the people. No, just no, not print the people. No. But anyway, this is what goes on with the routine. And now we have software routine. Right? Things that we do, for example, here is a simple app by Expedia, where you can say you're going to go somewhere. In this case, I want to go to Maui. And I type in, I, I want to go to Maui for my honeymoon. Should we stay on Maui or Kauai? And it will give you an agenda. It will bring up pictures. It will put up the hotels in a folder. Yeah, you would say, okay, that's really what the internet does, right? But it does it much better. It makes my story, my travel story. And yes, you can say, well, it's about 5% of reality, okay? It's not like I'm going to speak to a friend about Maui, you know? 
not the same thing, but very useful. And it sells like hotcakes. Expedia is very happy. Right? Salesforce has an app that the CRM that's called Einstein now, right, from Salesforce, uh, where you can actually have Salesforce look for leads in your database to see who's ready to speak to you again. Which I think will result in stupid emails like this again, you know, I want to connect on your growth plans. Well, who, yeah, okay. Anyway, it's still useful. And Microsoft, the co-pilot project, allows you to do things with Microsoft Office Suites using AI, like writing with that text, coming up with slideshows, uh, organizing whole new things that you would otherwise do manually. And this will be in every Office product. So what it means for us in the long run that if you're using these tools, your speed may go up two or three or four X in doing stuff. So your boss can fire everybody else because you're doing all that. Just, we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is, of course, a big issue. It's productivity gains. It's, that's what every company wants. So the bottom line is what's happening right now is we have this world where machines can start to understand what we're saying. It's not, you know, not in Latvian, sorry, or Swiss German. But very soon, yes. I mean, my own computer still doesn't know my name, you know, G-E-R-D. It always thinks of gastrointestinal reflux disease, but, you know, that, that's, that's just my name. Uh, it still doesn't know that because it's not English. You know? But it's learning. It will eventually learn. And then what's happening right now, we're all going to have these genies in our pocket. And there will not be mobile phones. There's already the first things that you put here. It's connected to the internet, and you say, hey, I need a date. Fetch me a date now. Right? And we'll go out and look for matches, so, like without a mobile phone. I imagine if three billion people do this, the kind of manipulation that, you know, who should I vote for? Ortegon. Yeah, just boom, push the button. And virtuality. We'll be able to see things differently. I'll talk about that in a second. But really what we have here is an interesting development. Generative AI will transform work and thereby education, training, and learning. Uh, I cut a piece of that chart off. It's from Accenture, but you can see. OK, so the green bar is high potential for automation. So that's office and administrative support, 57% potential of automation. Think about government here. Right? Right? Automation, automation, auto robotic process automation. Here, architecture legal, 33% automation. Research, paralegals, that's automation. The, re the red bar is augmentation. Things that are extra that you don't, you know, you don't drop them, you just... It's a huge bar. So here's the bottom line on this. Goldman Sachs says 300 million full-time jobs are impacted by this trend. Not destroyed, not yet, impacted. But think about what that means for training for your employees, what they have to do. Well, the, the thing is they have to avoid this, the things that can't be automated. And for companies, you know, IBM just announced they're going to not hire 7,000 people because they can automate. Christine Lagarde from the IMF said, automation is great for the economy, bad for society. <laughs> That's probably true. Uh, now we have to think about what do we do with 300 million people? I don't think that's bad news. I think basically if we have more product productivity, there's more money in the system, we can take care of those people. Right? But not if the money stays with the people running the network. Right? Facebook makes $150 million profit per day. Where does the money go? To Mark, 60% to Mark Zuckerberg, and to six major US cities. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. You know, we would have a social dividend there to really fix this problem. So as we move in this future with AI, it's quite clear, you know, we're going to go into a world where that's going to be everywhere. And so for us, it means our pyramid is changing, the pyramid of what we do. This lower part, data, information, and intellectual knowledge, we're moving up to the higher part of the pyramid. Down here, is computer turf. Of course we're going to have knowledge and information. But why would we learn every possible piece of information and download it when we can just 
you know, speak? I mean, it's an interesting question. Why would we learn a language? Well, because learning a language is a social skill. That's completely different. But why would I memorize all that stuff? If I can focus on this, deeper knowledge, tacit knowledge, understanding, wisdom, that's the mission. You want to be more productive? You know, culture eats technology for breakfast. Peter Drucker said the same about strategy or something. But, you know, companies and countries are successful because of culture, not because they have some fancy app. However, you don't have the fancy app and you have good culture, it's also a problem, right? So, so it's kind of like, yes, every person in the world has to be technology positive and, underst and, and, and understand it. Right? So you know how to look up things, you know how to use things, you know how to use a computer, you know how to use whatever. There's no way around that. Right? But this is really what we do. Human-only skills. Machines can't do that. For a machine to have intuition, imagination, wisdom, there's an old saying from Malawi, it says, knowledge without uh, uh, wisdom is like water in the sand. Machines have a lot of knowledge, but it's water in the sand. It's useful, but how real is it? And how much does it mean for us? So as we go into this future, we're going to get, we're going to get digitized. I mean, our routine becomes available to machines. That's not necessarily a bad thing, except for that we are missing the social context. We don't have any understanding of how we're going to administer this and who is in charge. That's something we have to think of. So here's the bottom line of this. For routine jobs, humans with better tools like AI will beat humans without the tools. Right? That, that's not new, <laughs> but it's more extreme with AI, more Darwinistic. Yeah? Very few tools will beat humans by themselves. If you play chess against the machine, you will probably lose. That is because chess is a logical effort. Even Go, you will probably lose, but now that has been fixed again. But an actual job, like a truck driver, right? a, a, a computer can uh, drive a truck on the highway. You can sleep in the back. But when the truck gets off the highway, all the games are, the game is changing. You have to figure out how to drive to the warehouse. Or the, no, the machine can't do that. So it's not as clear cut as that, as we're looking at this, but the bottom line is this. When you think about adult education, you work like a robot, a robot will take your job. If you learn like a robot, you'll work for the robot. Think about that for a second. I'm serious about this. If we learn like a machine, you know, downloading, storing, it's useless. I mean, no, it's not useless. It has its use, but it's very limited. Einstein said imagination is more important than knowledge, and he probably was the most knowledgeable human being ever lived. So this is really what we have to pursue, a different way of educating our people. You see here in this chart, basically what's happened with uh, artificial intelligence, the primary reasons for using it, you can see this long list. We're going to publish the slides later. Not rocket science, it's basically faster, more efficient, increase innovation, improve sustainability, yada, 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 yada. It's not new, right? But if we do this, it could increase GDP 4x. Some people are saying if we use artificial intelligence in most business processes, it can increase GDP 10x around the world. Of course, that's very tempting for a lot of companies, right? But what, what the benefit? Are we going to use the benefit to give that back to people, regular workers, not intellectuals, yeah, not people like us, the top 10%, but everybody? Well, that is the key question, because if we don't do that, we're going to end up with more money and they will end up with less, because they're the ones doing these jobs. Yeah. So a very, very big challenge on this. Automation is going to be everywhere. You know, starting with the factory, all the way to writing emails and, you know, you can sit at your desk and write a thousand emails just by swiping. Right? Augmentation, Apple, the new Apple, what's it called again, um, you know, the AR thing, I'll show in a minute. That's going to help us to see stuff. Right, it's only 3,500 euros, you know, for something that doesn't really work, but hey, you know, why not? If this augmentation and automation results in vacation. Right? 
In other words, benefit. Four-day work week, less work, same money. That would be good. Right? Think about all of this coming together, more productivity in 20 years, or maybe even 10 years, we're going to be at the point where there's so much money, because it's so productive, that we, we don't have to work at all. I mean, this is, of course, the basic income idea. Could be, you know, but not if we keep all the money and give it to the companies who run the system, right? Or just don't pay the taxes. Yeah. So that clearly won't work here. So when we, when we think about automated routines, we should not mistake a clear view with a short distance, Paul Sappho says. For example, check out in the supermarket. You can automate most checkouts in large supermarkets, but many small towns, the supermarket is where people meet and talk to each other and find gossip. You, know? you don't want to take that person away. That would be stupid, because that, that is the connector. Yeah? So it's not as simple as that. And especially when we think about, for example, self-driving cars. Are you seeing any self-driving cars here in Riga? Uh, OK, one or two, maybe. And yes, you can drive kind of by yourself and on the highway. But no, it hasn't come. And are you going to see a robot flying an airplane? In principle, it's possible. Would you travel an airplane without a pilot? Many of us would say, no, no probably not. Yeah. Of course, a pilot couldn't kill himself if he was a robot, and he wouldn't belong to a union, so there would be no strike. But yeah, probably not. So we should think about this and what it means for our future when we look in this direction. This chart is the most important. Using AI, we can learn stuff quicker. This is the adoption curve for people using AI versus the ones that don't. Like I said earlier, you use a better tool, you're ahead. Simple as that. But we should not let the tool take over by saying, we don't need me anymore, I can just use the tool. Because that's a kind of an illusion. Now, um, Ginny Rometty, the former CEO of IBM, has coined a new word right, called the new color workforce. Color is, you know, white color, green color, and so on. And the new color is people who work who don't have the degree, who just do the work. And this is happening everywhere. And this is where we should be looking. Do you really need a degree to, to do social media for your company or to make, you know, funny videos? for your social media or whatever it is, you can just do the job. So we're going to see what Google does. Professional certificates. You don't have to have a BI in engineering. You can get a professional certificate from Google. And so we're going to do a lot of work without formal degrees. That's very big in Canada, in Finland. I think it's a great idea to bring more people into the workforce. Uh, clearly, also, we're going to be able to deal with this VUCA thing, you know, the disruption much better because we can finally achieve velocity, unorthodoxy, co-creation using a less formal process. It makes sense. So part of that, I think, will be hitting us into the workplace in the future as well. So virtuality, we're going to go into the future like this, where we, we can see the internet in a 3D environment. Uh, I think it's going to be amazing, but it could, of course, be very addictive. It's like, you know, if you have know many people that do gaming, it's kind of like, yeah, it's, you stop eating or whatever you do, you're just kind of stuck in this. So Apple just uh, pioneered this, and here's a short clip. With Apple Vision Pro, you can create a perfect workspace, no matter where you are. Well, you get the point. I mean, to me, as a geek, it sounds amazing. <laughs> but, but I mean, OK, if that is the workplace of the future, maybe the only the privilege can be there because it's so expensive. I don't know. You need a T1 internet connection of 3,500 euros. It's going to be a while. It's like the metaverse concept, same idea. But I'm going to have dramatically increased skill acquisition using virtuality, digital twins, all that stuff. Great. There isn't much wrong with that, except for that I may like it too much. You know, so I'm wearing this when I, when I study, and then I come home in the evening, I look at my family, it's just so boring, because I, I 
you know, I'm not wearing my glasses. You know. That could be a problem, kind of like addiction to the mobile phone. So the issues of this. First of all, the issues of, of AI is quite clear. It leads to machine thinking. Right? Everything is data, everything is a machine, everything is a process, everything can be tracked. And you know for a fact that's utter BS. Right? There is no such thing. Real life is much more complicated than a bunch of data. This is why most things that are invented in the lab completely fail in real life until they're modified and modified and modified. Because real life is much more complex than, you know, we don't just put a chip in the brain to think faster. Every psychologist will tell you we don't think with the brain. We think with everything, with the body, with everything. I mean, it's completely obvious if you're human, most of us still are. And then when we look at this, this AI allegedly telling us what, what to do. Again, it's kind of like Google search where it allegedly tells us the answer, which is good, but we have to use our own judgment. And we should be very careful with this. You know, we think of uh, ChatGPT kind of like this. You know, there's a, there's a person. Right? But this isn't a person. It's a, it's, it's a box with cables. <laughs> it's not a person. It's not thinking. It's not caring. It's not existing. It's not conscious. It is just giving simulated advice. And for that, we should take it and use it where we like. All the other things you know, that we're seeing around the world happening, reductionism, manipulation, application, confusion, bias. We can't just go into a world and say, well, let's not have any teachers, we'll have a bot. That's like saying, okay, I'm, uh, I'm not gonna ever eat again, I'll just squeeze the astronaut paste. You know, that, that's sufficient. That's not going to be our future. So really important to realize where this is going because one thing that's happening is that machines are not programmed to care about the truth. Well, that's a hard thing to know anyway, the truth, right? That's not what machines do. It's about speed. It's about coherence. It's about patterns. It's about simulations. It's none of these things that matter to us. And this is why learning and education will stay personal and person to person and not just be virtual. Because that's real life. Right? Very important to realize how important all of that is also, of course, to democracy and our future. So if we want to build a good future, what I call the good future, that involves those pieces, we have to ask this question about technology. Right? Who is mission control? Right? Who, who actually says what is right or wrong? Because very soon we'll be seeing every story around the world, whether it's a newspaper or the television or the radio show, done by a bot. This is where we are going. That's probably not such a good idea because then we don't know what's what. I mean, the bot is very good. You know, it's a perfect simulation. It's like being in a, in a video game the entire time. So that is the question. Look at this chart saying paralegals, office admin support, lawyers, bookkeepers, we can increase productivity three to four and a half times. And I think that's great, but what is the benefit? I mean, if I work four and a half times as efficient, you know, I work for myself, so it doesn't matter, you know, I'm happy. But if you work for a company, your boss would say, well, that's amazing, our GERD is four and a half times as efficient, let me fire the other five guys. Not a good idea. Imagine that happens everywhere, then we're in deep trouble. <laughs> right? So basically, we have to think about how we're going to put this together. It could be heaven or it could be hell. If we want technology to be heaven, we're going to need standards, social contracts, regulation, understanding, global agreements. Artificial intelligence is kind of like a nuclear weapon, but much easier to build. We're going to have to agree on what we want with this or even on the lowest possible level. And what is the outcome? What is societal context? So if we have a machine that does this, a machine that understands the world, as the boss of OpenAI is saying, the coming change will center on the human capabilities, these four, the ability to think, create, understand, and reason. That is, don't look up, right? You've seen the film. That is the asteroid coming towards us. 
I do not want a machine to reason, right, to understand, to think, to exist. I think it's a crazy idea. I want the machine to get the job done and shut up. I don't want the machine to have rights or to understand anything or to be like me. And this is really ultimately what we want. I mean, it's a very big discussion as we're moving into this future of assisted intelligence, augmented intelligence, and super intelligence down here. That would not end well for us. A super intelligent person, entity, rules the other people who are less intelligent. That's what happened to Homo sapiens. Now, we took over from the Neanderthals, right? Because we were more intelligent. We killed them. They're gone. So it's very important that we realize where this is going. It is about competence, not consciousness. And anybody looking uh, to create con uh, consciousness in machines, I think, sh should be subject to regulation, like OpenAI and others. So some action items, and then I will wrap up. First, the whale. Just kidding, it's not the whale. It's about imagination. C.K. Prahalad, famous Indian philosopher, says, Imagining the future is more important than analyzing the past. Companies today are no longer resource-bound, they're imagination-bound. You want to do better as a company or as a country, you're going to need more, uh, more imagination, more narratives, more stories, more creativity, more unorthodoxy, not just more knowledge. And that is important that we teach our employees how to do this, that we equal the EQ and the IQ, right, the emotional quotient. The IQ is something that machines are achieving. There is just absolutely no way I'm going to compete with the IQ of a machine in 2030, you know, in terms of logic. That's already starting to be quite obvious. We don't just need reskilling, we need rehumanization. Put the genius back. That's what we want our employees to have, and our kids, of course, to go in this direction. We have to go away from this obsession with this. Right? This is a machine, it's a bot. Instead, we need learning and development to have these things. Human agency, discovery, right? Marshall McLuhan, imagination, intuition, compassion, empowerment, agility. And how do you learn that? Well, you can't send people on the training course for compassion. Well, I think you can try, but yeah, these are personality skills. It's your mindset that contains the future. Your mindset is limited, your future is limited. And this is, of course, a cultural thing that we have to learn, because in the end, it comes down to this. This is our future. This is the only jobs we're going to be doing. It's those jobs. Everything else a machine can do. But the machine does not understand any of this, because it doesn't exist. This is a tool. I can speak to my hammer and say, please, uh, build my house. You would have no idea how to do that. It doesn't even know what it means. So that's very important for us to keep track of this, where this is going. In the good future, as I call it, there's four bottom lines. First, we have to think holistically. Not just about ourselves, but about the planet, about the purpose, about work as being holistic, because work in the future will not be about working as much as we can. That time is closing. It'll be about working as little as we can and doing other things. Putting the human inside. This is the most important part. We should not put the tech inside. The tech is a tool. We should put the human inside so that we can create human values and relationships. Think of our intelligence that we have. We have eight different types of intelligence. Let's not think that machines can have any of this and let's not give them any of this either. Social, cultural, emotional. Finally, and I've pitched this many times, that this is happening actually right now, we're going to start building an international artificial intelligence agency. An agency that takes care of figuring out what to do next. So, Buckminster Fuller again. We are to be architects of the future, not its victims. If you are looking for adult training and to improve education, we have to architect the future, not wait for us for, for it to hit us. Thank you very much. <clears throat>